Yeah, a couple of days ago, um, YouTube have just announced plans to create dozens of new con uh, dozens of new channels, wow. all with original content, uh, signalling, um, well, basically, it's a challenge to TV. Uh, uh, indeed. <laughs> direct challenge. Um, they've uh, talked about lots of high-profile names, including Jay-Z, Ashton Kutcher, uh, some of the producers announced as having channels include Reuters, Slate, and the Wall Street Journal. Gosh. Um, Lionsgate's the only movie and television studio there, but there's a hundred new content partners, partners huh. um, including the creator of CSI. And they're, they're expecting to generate about 25 hours of new programming a day. Wow. Which, um, I don't know if anybody told them this, that you, you need an extra hour to watch it all and no sleep. <laughs> well, it's it's part of the whole twenty-five hour movement, perhaps. You know, maybe this is how they start. Right. Who knows? So, yeah, just somebody, somebody who dedicates their life to watching every new bit of video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a, a list. There there is a list of a lot of the channels. But I'm um, looking at the uh, article, the Reuters article. I'm I'm reading here. Uh, they say among the dozens of channels debuting are Awesomeness from Brian Robbins, uh, who's the producer of Smallville. Then there's Car and Driver Television, uh, Life and Times from the rap star Jay-Z, a pop culture channel from producer Ben Silverman, Smart Girls at the Party with Amy Poehler, Meredith Walker, and Amy Miles, Thrash Lab from Ashton Kutcher, oh, and, no. a, and apparently, I know, and Madonna's also going to be launching, well, was planning, apparently, to launch a dance channel. So I've got to say, so far I'm not necessarily entranced, but I'm sure there's going to be at least a couple of channels in there that'll be interesting. Madonna running a dance channel. Yeah. Right? The, <laughs> the horror. Yet one more thing that Madonna can suck the creativity out of. <laughs> uh, yes. So, but, but, but we will certainly be watching because I imagine there'll be actually quite a lot of, of cool sort of indie stuff, maybe some interesting science programming or technology I, programming. Most of the stuff that's going up there doesn't interest me directly, but mm. the, the fact that they're doing it and that a lot of it's, you know, material that will interest some people. Yes, who it's great. Who normally don't see much value on YouTube or, mm. or the user-generated content on YouTube mm. and, and want um, mainstream-type content yeah. on the web. Uh, it's getting it out there. Absolutely. Is, totally you know, new model. Any any threat to television is a good thing as far as I'm concerned. Well, yeah, and Google are probably some of the, the, the only people who are big enough to be able to stand up to the TV channels if mm. uh, and probably when they get really unhappy about it. Just, so there could be an interesting fight here <laughs> that's about to start. <laughs> uh, we'll, be, we'll be watching, as always, with, with some interest. All right, well, um, another article. This is just a quick one that we came across this year. It's It was written in, uh, sorry, this week. It was written in something called Orion Magazine, which I had not come across before, but it's a, an apparently a, an ecology sort of nature-type magazine. Most of their stories are about beasties in the wilderness and things. And this is just an absolutely gorgeous piece by a woman called Simon Montgomery. Um, the it's it's the feature article. It's called Deep Intellect, and it's about her encounter with octopuses, and one octopus in particular, Athena, who is a giant Pacific octopus. Yes, uh, two and a half years old, five foot long, uh, forty pounds, and and she just talks about not only about sort of the the incredible octopus eye and whatnot, but just her her interaction with these creatures, which are completely unlike us. Mm. I n I never realised that octopus octopi octopuses 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 have a dominant eye in the same way that we have a dominant hand. Yes, I hadn't realized that either. I think uh, it's lovely. So, so when it stares, you know, it'll stare at you with its right eye, mm. if it's curious. Absolutely. And I hadn't realized just how, how squidgy is not a very biological term, but just how squidgy they are and their ability to get through, you know, a cup, a, holes a couple of inches wide. Yeah. Um, but, but sort of then be a five-foot-long octopus or a seven-foot-long octopus. The other thing they're extraordinarily good at is knowing... Uh, how big that hole is. Mm. Uh, they can tell very quickly, just feel that with their, their tentacles, whether they'll make it through a hole. And if they can, they'll go straight through. If they can't... They Not can't. interested. Um, uh, yes, it's got me all, all excited. I've, I've, I've contacted our local marine education people to, to find out if they need volunteers to go and play with the octopuses. <laughs> <laughs> as one does um, the, the I think is very interesting it, it's come up a lot uh, it's often talked about in, in um, evolutionary circles because the octopus eye is very very similar in structure to the human eye 
and in capability. But uh, was com it's what they call convergent evolution. I mean, we split off ages and ages and ages ago from each other. Well, our, our, our common ancestors. But they've ended up with a very, very similar construct. Mm. And uh, also the, the uh, neurobiology as well. They, for whatever reason, probably losing their shells as mollusks, they uh, developed a requirement for Being smart. some form of intelligence yeah. um, and problem solving. And they've done that on a completely separate evolutionary path to us. So the, there's an awful lot we can probably learn from it. Octopus cognition. Absolutely. Um, there, there is uh, a wonderful video if anybody wants to watch it. I think it came out last year of an octopus using um, coconut shells as stilts. It's just about the cutest thing I have ever seen, <laughs> and then hiding in them at the end. It's just wonderful. You, you could hear people around the world going, "Oh, it's so cute." But um, and that actually brings us nicely onto uh, the next. It's this is a website, and it's called Time Tree. And it describes itself as a public resource for knowledge on the time scale and evolutionary history of life. So what you can do is you can put in to organisms, whatever they are. As Humans long, and octopuses. For example, uh, that's what we put in. I put in some other things that were more sort of political, but but it, it battled with those. Um, but, but in terms of actual actual uh, organisms, we put in octopus and human, and it returned the answer that we split off from them, well, our, our common ancestors split off 777.8 million years ago. It's a truly astonishing amount of time. Um, and they do it, uh, the, the website does it by pulling together a whole lot of resources, particularly looking at gene sequences. So it can be relatively, uh, relatively accurate, we think. But it's, it's great, great amounts of fun to just go and plug stuff in and be like, wow! <laughs> um... Right, now, uh, ah, yes, one quick book, and then we'll, we'll get on to some more talking. Um, this is interesting. Carl Zimmer is a writer. Uh, he's a science writer. He's done articles for Time Magazine and a, a number of other publications. He's also written some books, and he's just released his newest book, um, which is a lovely idea. It's called Science Inc., Tattoos of the Science Obsessed. Now, in about 2007, he started getting people to send to him at his blog pictures of their science-related tattoos, and this is the combination of that. Um, it's become quite a thing, and some of them are, you know, very, very geeky. Some of them are very arty, and they're, they're <laughs> some of them are geeky. How surprised! <laughs> well, How okay, surprised fair enough. Am I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Um, and some of them come with very, very, very touching stories as well. Uh, so I'd suggest having a look at the book, and certainly going and having a look at his website to see just how amazing and how dedicated people can be to the fields that they're involved mm. with. Uh, there's a, there's one that I've been humming and hawing about for years, just because it's just. So, so geeky and cool <laughs> is on the back of my neck. I would just like the HTML forward slash head and then body. <laughs> just so you know where one ends and yes, where one, one stands, as it were. That's fantastic. That's a really cool idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could definitely send it into something like this <laughs> and tell the story and have a whole lot of people be really impressed with you. Um, right, so yes, that that takes us on to um, sort of the next segment-ish. Um, Helen and, sorry, Calvin and, and I both attended something called the Retake the Net Bar Camp yesterday, and so I'm going to get Calvin to talk a little bit about that. Well, yeah, this is um, a really good event um, in the Wellington Town Hall, where basically a, a bunch of geeks and politically aware people uh, went along uh, led initially by the, the mayor of Wellington. And we had an unconference to chat about some of the most important issues, uh, as netizens that, that are occupying us at the moment. Uh, stuff like how I, you know, how we keep our privacy and our identity on the internet. Um, how we can do this, whether there are technological solutions to it, legal solutions. And, you know, stuff like, what do we actually want out of this? Mm. Um, one of the sessions I was in yesterday, I think we pretty much worked out that we'd like our cake and we'd like to eat it too. That's what we really want. <laughs> there's, there's something surprising. What, what we what we want is we, we'd we quite like to, for most people to have a, um, we think it's quite cool, 
uh, that people actually do have a verifiable online identity that mm. is theirs. But there's also a huge need for a pseudonymous identity or two, mm. something which is constant and can have a reputation attached to it, but yet is not directly attached to you or your place of employment so that you can have that. You can say what you want, mm. but you also, you're also not completely anonymous. You you have a reputation to be managed. And then there's also a need for completely anonymous. Yeah. Um, usually for political reasons that people can report abuse, they can whistleblow and stuff like that. And it's it's a tough one. No one really, you know, we, we didn't really have any solutions that one, someone could say, yes, all you need to do is... Mm. X and the world would be a better place, but it was good to get to get some discussions going. Talk about how the, the you know the Facebook monopoly and and things affect us all. Yeah, it was it was a fascinating day.